We thank you for all that. And everybody said, amen. John and his wife, Stacy, went down to the coast last week for that much needed rest because it's been a really hectic last few months for everyone, I think. And, uh, and he asked me if I would take this week, and I said, sure. And so um, here, here I am, and he's home, and he's nice and rested and everything, so I get to sit up here, and don't you guys start throwing stuff at me or anything like that. I'll, I won't pay a bit of attention to you if you do, okay? Okay, so um, we have Daniel's prayer today. You all know what that is, I'm sure you probably read that before, because it's one of the most beautiful prayers in the Bible. And um, it's uh, in Daniel chapter 9, and it, and it takes up about half of the chapter, about maybe two-thirds of the chapter. Because the other part of the chapter is really interesting also, and I won't, won't get into that unless I have time at the very, very end. Okay, So, uh, before we get started, I think I would like to read the whole passage. It's, it's a long passage. It's, it's verses 1 through 19. I'd like to read the whole passage, and then we'll come back and we'll start going verse by verse through that passage and, and try to get an idea and take a look at uh, what was going on with uh, Daniel at that time in, in his life, okay? So beginning with uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, son of Azuharis, one of the uh, lineage of the Medes who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish seven, 70 years of desolations in Jerusalem. Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications and fasting, sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed to the Lord my God and I made confession and I said, O Lord, great and awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments. We have sinned and we have committed iniquity and we have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and to our princes and to our fathers of all of the land and the people of all of the land. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you but to us shame of face as it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and all Israel, those near and those far off in all of the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. O Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, to our princes, to our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. We have not obeyed the voice of our Lord to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants, the prophets. Yet all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster for under the whole heaven such has never been done and what, as what has been done to Jerusalem. As it is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, has come upon us, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Therefore, the Lord has kept the disaster in mind and brought it upon us, for Lord our God is righteousness in all that he works and that he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. And now, O Lord our God, you have brought your people out of the land of Egypt with a mighty hand, and you made yourself a name as it is this day. We have sinned, and we have done wickedly. O oh Lord, ex ex according to all of your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury, fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear our prayer, for your, of your, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications. For the Lord's sake, because, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. 
Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For we, for we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and for your people who are called by your name. You had to read the whole thing because you just can't read part of that without, to, in order to gain what was in this man's heart. And we all know Daniel. We know the stories. There's lots of stories in Daniel, but there's some also some wonderful great prophecies in Daniel too. And, um, and today, let's just take a look at, um, at this prayer and, and how and when it came about and why it came about and see what we can find out. Um, let's start off with Daniel 9, uh, verse 1. You got it there. In the first year of Darius, son of Ahasuerus, of the lineage of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Okay, the first year of Darius. First of all, Darius actually, most likely, is not a name. It's more a title. There were, se there were several um, kings, several rulers that ruled in Babylon and then later from Persia. It was still in Babylon, but it was Persian leaders. And, uh, and there are several of them that, that uh, came to power over the time that the Jews were in exile in Babylon. And we've gone through in history, it's been really fun because a lot of scholars have made a lot of claims about, about who these various leaders were. But it's pretty sure that Darius was most likely um, a, a man named Syaxares the second of secular history. Because he, he ruled at this about the same time. Uh, Ahasuerus is also called Xerxes. Xerxes, of course, is, there were several of them, two, three of them. One of them was the one who was involved with um, Ruth, and um, excuse me, Esther, in the book of Esther. Do you remember that? He was the king, Xerxes. And um, uh, the Medes were early Persians living in what is now Iran. Uh, Iran loves to call it, Iran does not consider itself to be Arabic, and they don't speak Arabic, they speak Persian there, Farsi. And, um, uh, and to this day, when you talk to a person from Iran, they will always consider themselves to have come from Persia. And the capital of Persia at that time was, was, a, little, was a city, a big city actually, uh, there, uh, called Susa. And that's where Darius came from. Uh, the Chaldeans were the Babylonians. It's another name for the Babylonians. And um, um, so we start off with the first verse, and, we, and, and Daniel has already given us a, 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 a time stamp as to what the situation is in, where, in the land that he does live in. So that moves us then to verse 2. And uh, there we go. And um, in the first year of this reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. 70 years, okay? It's not hard to figure that out. Um, if you look at Daniel, Daniel most likely was taken captive around 606 B.C. And if you, if you do the math, we, we know that at this time that he's speaking, it's, it's uh, uh, 438 B.C. because that's when, um, that's when Darius took the throne. And so we do the math and we find out that there's 68 years there. That's only two years from 70 years. You can also find out how old Daniel was. And if we figure that Daniel was uh, 13 or 14 years old, probably 14 years old, that would have made him 82 years old. 82 years old. Now, I'm not quite that old, but I do know somebody, some dear friend of mine, who is pretty close to 82 years old. So would that person please raise your hand. There he is. <laughs> There's 82 years old, okay? So, so this is, imagine yourself that, as Daniel. And you've lived your whole life, practically your whole life, in a foreign city that was not your own. And you've missed your own home country and, and the ability to praise your God and worship him in his temple all of your life. And all of a sudden, you get a hold of some of Jeremiah's books, some of his scrolls, and you start studying these scrolls. And, and what do you do? You go to Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 11 and 12. If, you've got, if you have your Bibles, you can do that. It's not going to show up up here. Okay? But it's Jeremiah uh, 25, 
verses uh, 11 and 12, and you will see. And this whole land, he's talking about um, uh, Jerusalem now and, and uh, Judah. And he says, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Okay, that's the, fir that's the first time he says it. And then he says it again in Jeremiah 29.10, which is really close to that famous other uh, verse that we're all familiar with. 6, 7, 8, 9, 9, here we go, 10. Um, let's see. I'm going to start, I, I, I'm, I'm one of these persons who, when, when I'm quoting verses off of the, of the subject, off of our, our main subject, I usually try to give you a little bit of context with it so you can get an idea of why it relates back to why, why we're going there in the first place. So I'm going to start with verse 8, which, is, which says, uh, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you, nor listen to your dreams for which, you, for which, you, which caused you to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and I will perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. And here it comes. Then you will call on me and you will go and you pr will pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and you will find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Oh, I love that verse. That's one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Boy, you can, haul, you can just grab onto that verse and you can just carry that everywhere you go. Because, because if you're honest and you are humble, and you truly, truly search for the Lord, you're going to find him. He's going to, he's going to be found, because he is the truth. But that's the problem with so many people today, is that they're not doing it that way. They're doing it on their terms. And if you try to do it on your terms, it's not going to happen. You're not going to find him. You may, you may get some, some head knowledge, but your, your heart's not going to change. Well, that's another subject. Anyway... Um, so we can see then that Jeremiah did refer to all this. Now, somehow Daniel got this information, doesn't say, and, uh, and, he, and, he, and he's reading this, and he's, you know, he's a pretty smart guy, and, uh, and he figures this out, so he knows that we're looking at only a couple of years before it's going to be time for the, for the nation to be, begin to be restored, and he's worried. He's worried because he can look around him and he can see that even though they've been gone for seven years, there's still a whole lot of problem. And it, it makes sense because you've got a people who are, who are already completely immersed in sin, who got removed from their land forcibly. Many, many, many were killed, hauled off to Babylon. They have spent 70 years in this place, and we, we know what Babylon was like. I mean, if you want to think of a worldly city, it, it's the one that's spoken of so harshly in Revelation. And uh, so you know what it was like. And so you got to know that, that these people would have, had a, would, have, would have found it very difficult to maintain a love and a faith in God for that period of time. And plus, you've got, what, almost four generations by then. I think it's about right, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I, I try to look at it this way. If you want to figure out what that 70 years was like, go back to 1950. Anybody here? Can you? I'm, I'm, I was born in 1945, so I was five years old in 1950. And I can remember things from 1950. And, and imagine that this great upheaval would have happened in that year, and we would have all been hauled off to some who knows where, and we would have been in captivity doing who knows what for 70 long years. That's a long time. And, and just now, you know, you've got this old guy, and he's in there praying his heart out, knowing that this is going to end pretty soon but he's concerned. And that's what you, what you heard in those, in those words. Let's go to, um, let's go to verse 3. Uh, here we go. And then I set my face toward the Lord God to make request by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. Wow, these went all out. It's in the Jewish tradition, this is as good as it gets. I mean, you, you're just basically... You're just declaring yourself to be nothing and you are falling prostrate on your face in front of the Lord and you are simply giving him to him and laying your whole being at his mercy. 
That's really humility. I wonder how many of us can do that. Just, just let it go. And, and that's what he was doing. He said, he said prayer and supplications. Well, of course, we know the prayer. Supplications, that's asking for things. Okay? With fasting, and they had various forms of fasting, and we still do today. We still fast today. I grew up Catholic, and when I was a little Catholic boy, about way tall, five years old, 1950, when, um, and, and I was going to church, we had calendars. We had a church calendar. I think they still have them every year. And, and on that calendar, every day of the week, something was going on. There was either some feast day or some, some Catholic holiday, or it was something about fasting. And so I would watch the fast days and every Friday was a fish. That was me, me a fish on that day. And, uh, and anyway, uh, it, it was something that you did. The biggest, of course, the biggest fast of all was Lent, where you had 40 days of something. And we used to always, uh, I was in the third grade at the time, and we used to always you know, come up with something that we could give up for Lent. But that wasn't real fasting. Real fasting is where you truly do deny yourself. And uh, there's all kinds of things that's written on it because the church doesn't practice it on a, uh, it's not really a, 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 like a liturgical thing that, that the church does. This is above and beyond that. And so you do that when things really get tough. And this, there are things really tough for him. And, he, and, he, and, he, and he's wearing sackcloth. So sackcloth now, that's burlap sacks. That's the potato sacks, you know. Uh, in his case, he called them uh, uh, sackcloth for uh, um, putting flour and stuff like that. That's real coarse, coarse um, cloth. And I remember when we were kids, we used to take those, because they could get those anywhere, you know, go down to the feed store and grab a few burlap bags. And we'd get those, and we'd take a scissors, and we'd cut out at the top where, where it was bound, and we'd cut out a place for your head and make a tunic out of cut out arms on each side. I'd stick this thing on, okay, and we'd, I remember we, I put this thing on and go, oh, man, this thing's itchy. And, uh, and, and I'd tie it around my waist, and of course, off we would go with our swords, and we were Romans now, okay? And we were charging through the woods over in Lake Oswego, and we're... <laughs> Anybody got in our way, watch out. <laughs> but I remember how itchy and scratchy and uncomfortable that that thing was to wear. And that, is, that was a normal operation for Jews when they were very serious about their prayer. And, of course, ashes is another thing, and I never could understand that one. Um, they would pour ashes on their head, and they would get ashes all over them. So it must have looked pretty interesting when they were, uh, when they were going through all of this. But it was just simply a way to humble yourself completely as best you could to the Lord. You were, you were making yourself a nobody, and that's exactly what you were to him. Well, you know, it's not right. Um, if you were in sin... You were letting him know that you were laying your sin out there before him, and you were, you were so willing to repent from it. And so um, that's what he did. And let's see, Daniel chapter 4. Got it? There we is. All right. And I prayed to the Lord my God, and he made confession and said, O Lord, an awesome God who keeps his covenant and mercy with those who love him and with those who keep his commandments, that's, is that uh, 3 and 4? I think it is, yeah. Who keep his commandments. I won't read that verse. I am because it's part of the same sentence here. We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled, even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. So now he's speaking out loud, and he's speaking to God directly. Oh, our great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant. He keeps his covenant. And mercy on those who love him with those who keep his commandments. And he's telling him, God, we know that you are a loving God. And you do these things. And you have told us that in your, in your word that you do these things. And you've also told us what would happen if we disobey you. And when you think about it, these guys have been disobeying him for, for 100, over 100, and, 100 years, 150 years. And it's just been one thing after another. Is that, that reign of Manasseh for 55 years, my goodness. That thing was awful. It was one of the most awful reigns in the whole history of, of, uh, of Israel, of Judah. And, and then you get this little one shot with Josiah. And for 30 years, 30, uh, 30, 
30, not, 31 years, I think it was. For 31 years, things were fairly tranquil in, in, uh, in Jerusalem, except it was interesting because he went up and tore some of this stuff down, and you didn't get the feeling that the people's hearts were changed. He, tore the, he just tore the, tore the uh, idol, uh, uh, their, their objects of their idol down out of the high places. And, uh, and anyway, it, but it was, too, it was too late by then, and, they, and, and, and it was inevitable. Um, one thing, Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and maybe Josiah at the very, at the very beginning were all contemporaries. They lived it. They, they, they didn't overlap each other directly, but they were all living roughly at the same time. So it's not surprising at all when Ezekiel makes reference to Daniel. And, it, and really, a lot of the scholars look at that and they say, hey, wait, he's not talking about Daniel in, uh, in, in Babylon, who's in there with him. And, and other scholars are saying, well, why not? Daniel had done such great things. Look at those things that he had done for Nebuchadnezzar. And Ezekiel was there. And he would have seen all that. So it's not unusual to think at all that Ezekiel would have had a whole lot of um, ad admiration for, uh, for Daniel and for his faithfulness to God in the line of so much opposition sometimes from these Babylonians, especially these Babylonian, um, um, uh, uh, not say traps, um, the um, astrologers. And uh, the people who were supposedly keeping the king uh, abreast of what he was supposed to do by the gods. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't work out so well. So Daniel had an awful lot of opposition. That was just from the Babylonians. But he's not praying about that here. He's talking about him and he's talking about his people. I think I'm at Daniel's, I think I'm at 9-6 now, right? Yeah, 9-6. Neither have we heeded your servants, the prophets, who spoke in your name and to our kings and to our princes and to our fathers and to all the people of the land. I guess they haven't heeded the, the servants. They not only didn't heed them, but they killed them in some cases. And we know the stories of what happened when the prophets tried to prophesy. Uh, I think it was Zedekiah. It was Zedekiah who cut. They brought, they brought the prophecy to him. And they read it to him, and, 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 he, would, and he cut it up in, into little shreds, threw it into the brazier, and burned it up. That's what he, that was what he thought of God's word. And then he went to the people who were telling him what his itching ears wanted to hear. And, and of course, that's what he did, and it just got them into more and more trouble. Because they were sinning so exceedingly. And of course, the prophets, there were many of them who tried to speak to them along the way, and there were many of them that, Je uh, Jeremiah, my heart goes out to that man. I, I, I have studied Jeremiah for, for many years because I see, uh, personally, I see Jeremiah as being a, pro a prophet who lived in a time very much like ours, where you live in a culture of people who really don't really want to hear what you have to say at all. And they're not interested in God and they're not interested in you. And when you say things to them and tell them, tell them things that they do not agree with that come from the Bible, they sometimes get very violent with you. And they did with Jeremiah. Of course, you know the, the story of him getting thrown into the cistern and, and having to spend days in there. And I'm sure that there, there are more than one story of what happened during Jeremiah's lifetime. But it was all said and done and, and, and when uh, uh, Nabonidus was going through and taking a tally of all of the prisoners that were going to be shipped off to Babylon, here was Jeremiah. And they, they knew about him. And uh, they knew that, that he had been prophesying for them to, to uh, lay down their arms and just give up. And it maybe wouldn't go so bad with them. But they didn't do that. And so the, so the Babylonians, they didn't bother Jeremiah. And he was able to continue his prophecy. But what's really interesting, though, is that the kings that were left, all the way down to Zedekiah, still treated him wrong, wrongly. And, uh, and when it was all said and done, here was Jeremiah writing Lamentations. And that is another sad, sad story of a people who are totally, totally broken. And, uh, and that's, what, that's what they were. And so we've got Jeremiah then, and we've got Daniel. And Daniel, of course... Daniel is so interesting because he, God gave him some absolutely wonderful prophecies for our times. And they dovetail in with Revelation. 
It, they, a lot of people say Daniel is the is the Old Testament's revelation, book of Revelation, and, and, for, and, and in a lot of ways it is. There's so many things that are parallel to the book of Daniel, and that's where we get corroboration. That's where we're able to say, hey, you know, it's here, and it's here first, and then here it is, thousands of years later, almost exactly the same thing. And, uh, and we know that these guys weren't copying each other. If they did, they would say so. When Jesus talked about Daniel, he esteemed Daniel so much that I don't think there was any other Old Testament prophet that he talked about any, anything like he talked about Daniel. And there it is. That's why it, it really often, it, it, uh, it just boggles my mind when people can, can say, because there's an awful lot of people in Christianity that say that Daniel was not written when Daniel said it was written, but it was written long, long later. And it was supposed to have been an uh, uplifting book for the Jews during the time of Antiochus Epiphanes, which was way back, way up in uh, uh, 100, 200 B.C., you know, during the, during the uh, reign of the Greek uh, kings after Alexander the Great. He was, a, he, was a, he was a scumball. He really was. He was not a nice guy. And, uh, and he, made, he made the Jews suffer tremendously. And so some people think that that's when Daniel was written. But that makes it, that gives it a lie then. And I, don't, and I can't handle that. So anyway, uh, but, but rest assured, though, it, you may talk to some of your fellow Christian friends who may tell you that. They say, oh, don't, don't, da, da, Daniel, no, 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 no. Don't believe that stuff. That's just supposed to help you to feel good and to, and to, and to love God more. Okay? All right, let's go to Daniel chapter uh, 9, verse 7. 7? You yeah, got it there. O Lord, righteousness belongs to you, but to us shame of face. And it is this day to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and to all Israel, those near and far off, and the countries which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. He's laying it right on the line. He's not messing around. No mincing of words here. This isn't, this isn't a nicey-nicey prayer. Okay? This is a nitty-gritty prayer. Lord, here it is, 70 years. This exile time that you, that you, that you forecasted and, and that you put us through in judgment is about to end. And these regimes are changing in front of our eyes, Lord. What's going to happen? You know, I mean, what's going to happen to us? We know that we are still sinners. We know we, you are the God of righteousness, okay? And, and to us belongs nothing but shame of face. What's going to happen to us? And that's what he's, that's what he's asking. But, but don't, get, don't get worried because it gets better later on, okay? All right, uh, we are in seven. Let's go to eight. Uh, o Lord, to us belongs shame of face, to our kings, our princesses, princes, our fathers, because we have sinned against you. There it is, the shame of face again. Um, do we ever use that word shame anymore in our culture? We used to when I was a kid, when I was younger, but I don't, I don't hear it used very often. Any, any of you come across it in your, in your course of conversation or hear it, you know, maybe in the news or... Uh, in your reading or anything like that? Because it's really something that's, uh, it's an interesting word. It's, it's what we feel. It's what Adam and Eve felt when they sinned in the garden. Shame. It's this idea that I've sinned against God, and I know I have sinned against God, and it's the feeling that I get in the pit of my stomach. That's, that's the shame. And when you do it to someone else, you shame them. Shame on you. You shouldn't do that. Um, that's not... That's a good word. There's nothing wrong with that. You can use it wrongly, but uh, unfortunately, it's not used very much anymore. Verse 9. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Mercy and forgiveness. There's, there are two of, God, of God's qualities that are priceless. I don't know... I don't know of gods in other religions that, de that have mercy. Now, in Islam, yes, but, he, but the God in Islam is a trans fully transcendent God, meaning he's not personal. You can't, you can't go talk to him and have a conversation with him at all. Okay, he's transcendent. You just ba basically wait to see what he does and hope he does good stuff to you. Okay, hope he has mercy on you. And, but I don't think any other really, I don't think any other gods talk about things like mercy, okay, and forgiveness. 
He's talking about forgiveness. To the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness. And he's reminding God that you are a forgiving God, Lord. And boy, and I, he's not saying that right here, but you can just hear him thinking it. Boy, oh boy, do we need forgiveness. And uh, in verse 10, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, our God, to walk in his laws, which he set before us by his servants and his prophets. So now he's talking about not only have they sinned, but they have not obeyed. They have not been obedient. And of course, we know that. And of course, we know what all those scriptures in Deuteronomy, especially Deuteronomy, I think it's 28, they all lay out all these blessings that he's going to give them. And it sounds so wonderful. I can just see everybody closing the book up when they get to the end of that passage. Oh yeah, go for it. Blessings. And then you forget that there's another section comes right after it. And it's not pretty. <laughs> it says, if you don't obey, then you can expect these things to happen. So he's given them a conditional statement. If you, if you obey, great things are going to happen. If you don't obey, it's not going to go so good. And that's exactly what has happened here. Verse 10. Did I do verse 10? Yes, verse 11. Yes. All Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Where therefore the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. Here he is going to the sin again. And he's, t and he's letting God know as, as clearly as he can that he and his, and his people have sinned against God. And his heart is being poured out right now. Transgressed, of course, transgressions are sins. Okay? You, uh, you, you, you cross the line. You go over the line and you sin. And, uh, Israel, and has departed so as not to obey your voice. So Israel has gone its way and God has poured out the very things that he promised. And you know, he just doesn't, he doesn't sit around and just wait and say, okay, I can't wait to get a man. As soon as they make a mistake, boy, down it comes. Okay, I'm sending them off to Babylon. No, 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 no. There was years and years and years of this stuff that he kept saying over and over again. Of course, all these kings, would you get three, one, three kings? I don't remember how many good kings there were. They were all in Judah. They didn't have a good king in the northern kingdom. And there were three or four of them in, in, uh, in Judah. The last one being Josiah. Okay, verse 12. He has confirmed his words, which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us by bringing upon us a great disaster. For under the whole of heaven there has never been done what has been done to Jerusalem. That's how serious it was. These people should have been wiped out. I mean, it's amazing to see a people go... And, and be completely uprooted, put into a foreign land, spend 70 years there, four generations, three and a half at least, and, uh, and, and then be ready and, and yearning and wanting to go back to their homeland. Why? Because they knew inside, they knew what that place represented. They knew that, that, that Jerusalem and the temple was where God, at one time, his glory rested. And they wanted to go back to that again. And so Daniel here is praying. Whether Daniel ever went back, I don't know. We don't know. It's not, there's no scripture that indicates whether he ever got back or not. I mean, he was 82. He, he, he was, it depends on how old he was when he was taken. And, if we, and we, everybody thinks it was, he was pretty young. But people don't think he was much older than 14. Some go as far as 70. Anyway, he could be anywhere between 80 and 85. And, uh, but 82 sounds like a good age. And uh, let's see, verse 13. As it is written in the law of Moses, all of this disaster has come upon us. Yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Lord, we have not turned. We have not made any effort to do anything. Oh, Lord. So... You can imagine the situation that Daniel feels like he's in. And then verse 14. Therefore the Lord has kept the disaster in mind 
and brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteousness in all the works which he does, though we have not obeyed his voice. All right, he did it. He sent him there. And we have the book of Lamentations to show of a people completely broken. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works that he does, though we have not obeyed our voice. He had every right to do what he did because they deserved it. And they made no attempt whatsoever to repent from what they were doing. And, and he, he was so slow to anger. And, he, and we've got all those minor prophets and all the things that those fellows wrote. Ever, ever go through and read the minor prophets? They're just fascinating. And most of those prophets, I think I'll make most all of them, maybe, maybe uh, um, Jonah wasn't at that from those, those years, but uh, several of them were. And they were not just from the, uh, uh, the exile, they were from before the exile too. And they prophesied all these things. And Isaiah was a big, great one. He was before the exile. And uh, he told them, all these things are coming. Nope, nope, don't care. And so in verse 15, And now, O Lord our God, who brought your people out of Egypt with a mighty hand and made yourself a name, as it is in this day, we have sinned and we have done wickedly. Here he is again. He's letting them know that, I don't know what to do, Lord, because we have just sinned. And what are you going to do with us? Well, what is God going to do with them? We'll find out, I guess. O Lord, according to all, uh, verse 16, according to all of your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all those around us. I wonder if I could pray that about my country. My country is a reproach to all around them. You know, it's funny because here in this country, we, we think, we, we go around and we tell each other, and that's, that's, not, that's not within Christian circles, it's within the culture itself. We tell each, we tell each other how good we are and how we've been so good over the, nation, over the years, you know, for all these nations. And to some effect, that's true. We have been. We have been a model nation in so many ways. And so people will, will say that. And they will say how good we are. But then they do other things that show, that, that just boggle the minds of other people in the world. And they, and they say, you can say, they look, at, they look at abortion. Other nations do. Muslim nations do. And they look at abortions and they say, you call yourself good? How can you ever even think that? You say we're bad. Look what you do to your own unborn children. And we, it just sloughs right off of our head. Don't even hear it. Verse 18. Oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is called by your name. For you do not, we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. So, Lord, I'm going to be asking you things, Lord. I want you to open your eyes, and I want you to, to um, and see this, the desolations of the city called by your name. But it's not because of anything we've done, Lord. It's not because of our righteous deeds. It's because of you, Lord. It's because, uh, because of your great mercies. And that's so, so, so true. Um, the righteousness that we have is, is, is imparted by God to us. We don't have any righteousness. We don't. We we can do things all day long and say feel, and make ourselves feel good about what we're doing. That doesn't give us righteousness. It's filthy rags, according to the Lord. And you and if I say if I were to say that sentence in in some circles, it would just absolutely cause an uproar. Because our our culture is so ingrained to this notion that what 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 what, what some people think is right is it's right. Period. Cast in concrete. And so, therefore, if anyone disagrees with that, then there's real serious problems. Verse 19. O Lord, hear. This is the last verse. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, listen and act. Don't delay for your own sake, my God. For your city, your people are all called by your name. All right. This is it. This is the bottom line right here. He's saying, forgive us, Lord. 
We need that forgiveness. Please listen to us, Lord, and act. Get us out of here. I, I added that. Uh, don't delay for your own namesake, for your city and for your people who are called by your name. And that's the end of his prayer. Now, it's not up here because I, it's a little bit of that I added. I, I thought if I had a little, a little time, which I do, that uh, I, would, I would go ahead and give you a little taste of what's coming. This, it sounds really bad here. I mean, when, when Daniel's making this prayer, you would think that he is afraid that, that God is going to say, at the end of 70 years, I'm done with you, forget it, you're done, that's it, and walk away. And, but God doesn't do that that way. And so, Daniel, of course, is going to get surprised again because interesting things are going to happen. So it's not up here, but I'll read it anyway. Daniel verse 20, Daniel 9 verse 20. Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, of, um, for the holy mountain of my God, while I was doing that, Verse 21, yes, and while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. So there's where we get the rest of the time stamp. It's in the, it's in the evening, it's in the late afternoon, okay, on, in the first year of Darius. Oh no, Dan, Daniel's real good about telling us when things happen. And here's Gabriel. This is the angel. This is the same Gabriel that came to Mary and, and announced to her that she was going to give birth to Jesus. Same guy. Same angel. Must be one of God's special, special uh, um, top echelon um, uh, White House staff angels, I guess. So uh, anyway, here comes, here comes uh, uh, um, Gabriel. And then he informed me. And he talked to me. And he said, Oh, Daniel. I have come forth to give you skill to understand. Understand. Oh, yeah. And at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. And I am, have come to tell you that you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the visions. Here he is, back again. He was there, by the way, in chapter 8. Okay. Daniel's also got that weighing on his mind. I didn't even tell you about that. But in chapter 8 is where he got the visions of the little horn. Remember all the ten horns and the little horn and all that? And he's sitting here scratching his head wondering what on earth is going on here. And he, so he's got that. And that was the last time. And then, and then Gabriel left. And now he's come back to finish explaining what all this means. Well, this is where in, in verse 24, this is where we're going to start the rest of the chapter. And we're going to get the... the, 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 the um, passage of the of the uh, 70 weeks where Daniel where he where where God tells Daniel how much time he has got allotted for the Jews before he wraps it up and he lays out the 70 weeks plan well that's for another lesson and we could talk about that at another time but that's it that's the that's the hope that he brings for Daniel so when Daniel gets up off of that floor and walks over to a chair, or to something to sit on. I don't know. He had to have been just mentally totally exhausted. Especially because he's, he's not going to do that until he hears all the rest of this stuff. The rest of the chapter there. The, the vision of the 70 weeks. And he's still perplexed. And then he's going to get another vision in chapter 12. The last chapter. And, uh, and, then, and this time though the angel is going to, going to tell him to go his way. And rest with his fathers. And that the time at the end will come as it is said. So it's so wonderful because God, who is, a, who is a transcendent God, yes, and he's an awful and mighty and infinite and powerful God, yes, but he's also a personal God who loves us. And he's the God who wants to come and he wants to communicate with us. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, come, let us reason together. Now reason, you get into reason, now you're talking, you're talking Aristotle type stuff. But that's exactly what reasoning is. That's how we use reasoning. Reasoning is the process that we use to pursue the truth doesn't mean that it leads us to the truth every time, but that's how we pursue it because it's how we organize our thoughts and it's how we build one thought upon another thought until the thoughts get more complex. That's what reasoning is all about. Reasoning can be used for evil just as well as it can be used for good. So here we have it. So 
In closing, all I can say is that I love this guy, Daniel. And I, and I love how he dealt with these Babylonian people and these, especially these Babylonian leaders. It, would have been, it had to have been tough to deal with Nebuchadnezzar because the guy was such a hothead. And, uh, and, and I mean, he was, he was one of these guys who was real passionate about what he did. And he could go off on a tangent real quick, as we saw when he had the dreams and he threw some people in the oven. And, uh, and when he went and got himself so, he went and broke, started bragging about how he was a god. And he ended up walking around eating grass for, what, seven years during the, his reign. He didn't reign that long. So... He was a bad guy. He wasn't a bad guy. He's an interesting guy. A, a lot of people wonder whether or not Nebuchadnezzar will be in the kingdom when we, when we get there. I don't know. I uh, don't know. It's one of those things. We just have to wait and see. So anyway, that's pretty much it. So can, can, can I close in prayer then? Father, Lord, here's Daniel. He's...